Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, hi, I'm Justin. Um, I'm a developer. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about a project I've been working on. Um, it's been called Althea for two years, but I've been working on it for a very long time, um, off and on. Uh, and it's, uh, and we call it Althea, and it's for a more pragmatic, decentralized ISP. Uh, you'll notice I'm not necessarily calling that, uh, uh, calling it like a mesh networking community builder or like a mesh network builder. It's a slightly better ISP, and or a lot better ISP, hopefully. Uh, but that's sort of the strategy that we have going into it, is to ask the question, uh, what's the minimum amount of work we can do? Uh, what's the smallest transformation we can make on the way internet access is currently provided that would make it better, uh, that would really help everyone? Um, and so like, to illustrate that point, we have, uh, we have a home. They, uh, let's assume they're already somewhat fortunate and have a selection of two evil internet service providers instead of only one evil internet service provider. You may replace these with your local monopolies. Um, what, is, what can we do in this really terrible situation to make it better? Um, and I think uh, we have to start by asking, like, how is bandwidth uh, sold? And the correct answer is that it's not. You don't buy internet access from Comcast or, well, so, no. Um, you don't buy data from Comcast or AT&T you buy a subscription with an option to maybe receive data some of the time. Um, and you'll notice how many qualifiers that has before you get to, oh, look, I have my megabyte of data here. Um, so if you want to switch from one of these providers to the other, it may take you months or even years if you are locked into a contract. What could happen if, for example, you could switch between uh, providers once a month? Uh, and say, okay, this one's cheaper. I'm going to switch to this one this month. What if instead of once a month, you could do it once a day? What if instead of doing it once a day yourself, what if something? What if it was an automatic mechanism? Um, so let's conceive of a, of a situation where your home router switches between Comcast and AT&T, depending on which one is cheapest in the past 10 minutes. Um, so what would that do? And the correct answer is that, would, is that it would already do away with their, uh, with their malicious and deceiving pricing structures where they try and lock you into a multi-year contract for an upfront rate that's not real at all. Um, and it would immediately force both parties to start price fixing, because uh, let's not pretend they would actually start to compete. Um, so you would immediately have a flat known rate for internet that's already better than where we are. Not much, but it's something. Um, but what does it take to really, uh, to, to really dramatically improve this situation? And that's the possibility of a third party, any sort of third party, to break the price fixing cartel. Um, so, if you can, so provided that you can switch between internet service providers uh, instantaneously and automatically, and you can pay them quickly, uh, and, that's the, and the transaction is your entire relationship with the provider, um, and it suddenly becomes much more attractive to start, some, uh, to start like a small ISP. I mean, uh, right now, if I want to build infrastructure, if I put my time and effort uh, into connecting a part of downtown to a really rural area, um, it's not really going to do anything. You know? So now I have this link from downtown. Congratulations, I can get gigabit internet out to these people who currently pay who currently pay exorbitant prices for much less than that, but I still need to do everything else. You have to be the entire ISP at once. What if we could reduce that barrier? Um, and so if NeighborNet could come along, uh, make this line, and immediately everybody would switch to NeighborNet, the, the, the realities of being an ISP is very different. Um, suddenly you no longer need to do everything, you just need to do something better. Um, and it starts to reflect uh, other business types a little bit more realistically. For example, we don't live in a world where only Taco Bell sells food. We live in a world where restaurants are relatively plentiful. It's not necessarily easy to start a restaurant, but it's not like there are, we are in some extreme dearth of them. Uh, yet there's this impression that, uh, that internet service providers are some exception, that they don't 
follow the normal rules and that it's impossible to uh, compete with very large uh, corporate service providers. Um, so yeah, what is Althea? It's not, a, it's not a new internet. It's a way to get to what you would consider the existing internet with all the problems that it has. Um, and it's not a new mesh networking protocol. We build on top of Babel, and I'll explain that later in my presentation. Um, what it is is a new way to buy and sell connectivity specifically with the goal of making it much easier to be an ISP and much easier to start your own network. Um, so people who aren't already familiar, I know a lot of uh, people here especially will, will be familiar with the, uh, with the numbers and the statistics, uh, but what it really comes down to uh, is that a lot of these huge internet service providers, they own a lot of infrastructure, it's old, it's expensive, it's buried, um, and it's been around for a while, and people see that it's insurmountable. I can't go down the street and bury a new fiber line. It's going to cost me millions of dollars. But uh, while that has been, but while the infrastructure has been uh, sitting underground, um, technology has continued to progress independently of that. And modern wireless uh, long-distance point-to-point hardware, which most people use for community mesh networks as well as wireless ISPs, is very effective and very cheap. And you can beat uh, so like. 40% of US households have less than 100 megabits at home. For a uh, $60 antenna and an $80 router, uh, you can get 40 megabits. And that's with Althea's software doing some overhead. You can get 100 with that if you are really trying to push the pedal to the metal. Um, so the point is that the infrastructure cost to beat these huge incumbent ISPs that people think are undefeatable is actually fairly tiny. Uh, you know, restaurants cost dozens of times this to start. Um, not that starting restaurants is the most accessible uh, thing. You know, obviously not everybody does or can, but it's at least better. You know, moderate measured improvement. Um, so yeah, it's really a coordination problem. Uh, how do you get people together to connect them? Because uh, in the way that internet is not like a restaurant is that you can't ship um, is that internet is not shipped one day a week and then you can unpack it and use it for the remainder of that month. It has to be, um, you have to build a network of continuous connectivity that can deliver packets quickly and effectively. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, I actually wanted to take a minute to address uh, like the difference. So uh, we use the word mesh a lot and I think it's confusing how little we stop to define it because, it's, uh, because it means a lot of different things in a lot of different contexts. So I'm going to go over the concept of like mesh as a network layout, mesh as a software, and then there's sort of the philosophy uh, idea that I'll get into a good bit later, towards the end of my presentation. So uh, here we have green, which is a pretty purely peer-to-peer -peer network. If you really wanted it to be more meshy, you would want a more dense series of connections, but everybody's equal. You know, everybody's connected to at most two other people. Um, but this network isn't, uh, isn't super practical. Um, even, though it's very, uh, even though it's very egalitarian, um, somebody trying to stream uh, a video or do any sort of traffic from one end to the other will experience a, uh, a, a higher chance of failures and generally more issues it takes. Uh, I think it's six or seven hops from one end to the other. Whereas both of these uh, small world networks that have really big nodes uh, that are not so egalitarian, um, you can get from anywhere to anywhere in two hops. So uh, the point of this illustration um, is that the ideal network doesn't necessarily look like either of these. It looks a little bit of both. For example, if you were to connect these three, if you were to have connections along the bottom here, or maybe some of these nodes were to connect to a larger node, you would have a network topology that was both resilient to failure um, and capable of routing around problems, but at the same time still fast enough for people to use practically. Um, as an interesting note, most of the community mesh networks, like NYC mesh, um, mostly look like pink or purple just for practicality issues. They have a little bit of dense uh, of, of denser connections uh, on the inside. Um, but this, these like network, these physical layouts are independent of what we would call mesh networking software. Because uh, 
So like the software side of mesh networking is responsible for taking any physical network you give it and letting you get anywhere. So with that defined, um, I feel a little bit more comfortable going on and, uh, and like talking about mesh networking software as well as mesh networks without people getting confused as to the line and what we really mean when we talk about either of them. So just one last recap. Any of these networks is appropriate and can use mesh networking software, but you wouldn't necessarily call it a mesh network layout or topology. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so like I've already said, the goal of Althea is to, is to help make it easier for people to start networks and practical for people to run networks, to use the, uh, to, to like gain income based on their contribution and uh, try and make something that is a sustainable, uh, perhaps you could see it as a small business, you could organize it as a community network. We don't really see that as ours to define, we see it as ours to build the tools to make this easier. Um, so like as far as our design goals, we want to invent as little as, as possible. There's some really great software already out there and we prefer to use that. Um, we want to use commodity router and antenna hardware. Uh, so we don't want to tell you what, what hardware to use. Uh, that's also not our business. Uh, software can in principle run on anything and we should try and achieve that where at all possible. Um, and more importantly, we should try and make our software efficient enough that you can do all of this. You can have this ease of setup. You can have this automated payment. You can have this automated network layout mesh software, which already exists, um, in an uncompromised manner at a very low cost. We can't eliminate barriers to entry, but we can at least bring them down as low as possible. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, uh, mesh networking protocols already exist. And uh, in fact, I had a really great slide where I compared the state of the art in mesh networks. But uh, when I practiced this presentation, I realized that, that was a presentation in and of itself. Uh, so I'll, maybe I'll do that at some future time. Um, and OpenWRT lets us run on pretty much any embedded device. And cryptocurrency and payment channels let you essentially hand cash to anyone you want. Now, exactly which cryptocurrency is, once again, not something we are deciding in our implementation. Um, in fact, if you wanted to make like some sort of mesh coin or that's really just like representative of like points within a community, you're free to do that as well. Um, we're mostly just working on the configuration and the exchange, uh, not exchange in the monetary sense, but exchange in you hand, band you hand some unit of something to someone in exchange for bandwidth. Um, and what we need to build, uh, this is actually uh, sort of where things get interesting. So. Existing mesh network software uh, has sort of two ideas of security. Uh, there are, there is, everyone is allowed and everything is allowed and it's up to the people to go around and solve problems. And there is, we will keep out everyone but this group of people, but all the first set of rules apply to the people that are allowed in. Uh, we didn't want that. We wanted something where anybody could join the network and participate as a full member without having to, uh, without uh, relying on a group of administrators to actually handle things for them. Um, and so that means we need to add, uh, add some anti-faking features that, uh, that, that don't really exist in any modern mesh software, so that's the biggest change we have to make. Um, billing software, that's fairly straightforward. You keep track of how much data people use and you invoice. Um, and oh yeah, we need to run all of this in about a tenth of a Slack tab because that's what OpenWRT routers have. Um, so yeah, uh, in the end we decided to build on top of Babel, which is what Pseudomesh uses for their mesh networking software as well as several other networks. Um, and we added a few different things to uh, help us prove uh, that people are advertising, uh, are actually offering what they say they're offering, and to make sure that nobody ends up uh, buying or, uh, sorry, purchasing bandwidth on incorrect terms. Um, so yeah, here, uh, here's actually an interesting diagram. Uh, and, and so the process that I'm going to explain to you is called distance vector, and it's actually used by pretty much any mesh networking software outside of CJDNS, which has gone from 
some sort of overlay network routing to some sort of link state routing. And I'll let them comment on what's going on there. Um, so, <laughs> so in this case, we have router, you know, we have a small network here. And A wants to send packets to G. They'll find, uh, A will find the cheapest route, which in this case is the sum, uh, so let's do the sum of cost. So five, eight, uh, that's one, and you have to go through 10. So then it's A, C, E, G uh, is the lowest cost. Uh, because I didn't want to make this diagram very complicated, A, C, E, G is also the best route to take for other reasons. Um, in theory, you could have a mix of uh, reasons to take different routes. But uh, the, okay, yeah, 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 that's where I should start. Um, so currently, uh, distance vector mesh, mesh, mesh routing protocols, uh, they tend to operate on a fairly simple metric. Some of them use hop count, which is the easiest one, which is just, hey, you know, I am hop zero, because I'm me, I can talk to me with zero hops. Uh, and then somebody next to me says they can talk to me with one hop. The next person says two hops, so on and so forth. And when you're looking for the best way to talk to somebody, you're like, hey, you know, everybody around me, uh, how far away is Justin from you? And you just take the sh shortest response. You know, one guy says, or, um, one guy says two hops. Um, someone says one hop. You're like, okay, I'll take one hop. And you send traffic that direction. Um, but if you want to do any of this uh, payment stuff, uh, you need to be able to know that they aren't lying. So you try. And, so in this case, we use what we call verifiable metrics, um, which are metrics that you and the person you're communicating with can get together and say, "Yeah, that's right." You know, what's being advertised is what we're actually getting. Um, so in this case, you see like a loss rate, which is a packet loss rate, where one is no packet loss and zero is uh, no packets. Um, and you can simply multiply those along the path, and it'll be the same when multiplied as they would be individually um, as you traverse the path. So um, by actually using uh, packet loss rate and round trip time and other metrics that you can check, and then actually checking them, we can we can identify uh, nodes or people who are being malicious um, without having to ban new people from just up and joining the network. Uh, so we don't have to concern, um, so we don't have to be too concerned uh, with letting a new person onto the network because we can figure out if they're being uh, not a nice person. Um, yeah, so another thing that we really wanted to focus on is, uh, is, is, is making sure that everything was, was secure by default. Um, and so what we do is that we have the you know, same network before, and all traffic goes by default over a wire guard tunnel to a VPN that is used to connect users to the outside world. And, uh, this, um, and this VPN makes sure that users can select who they want to be able to see their traffic. Because unfortunately, well, uh, as a design choice, we are focusing on providing access to the existing internet with all of its problems, including uh, unsecured HTTP. And uh, so you have to trust somebody to forward your traffic. And with this design, users at least get to choose who, independent of the physical infrastructure. Uh, once again, it's still not perhaps the ideal situation, but it's better than what you currently have, which is you have no choice but to trust the physical provider of your infrastructure not to spy on your traffic. Um, yeah, this is actually, uh, so I was having a conversation uh, with some of the pit mesh people last night, and um, I realized that not everybody has quite heard of WireGuard yet, uh, and I guess it's actually pretty new. Um, but the nice thing about WireGuard is that it's free, uh, open source, and the most fa uh, sorry, the fastest uh, and most efficient uh, VPN you can have at this point. It runs very well on embedded devices. Um, and generally, uh, even if you're not going to be using Althea, I would really like to encourage uh, community match networks to consider putting, uh, putting something like this on, on nodes that they distribute. 
just because uh, unsecured traffic is uh, so you know it's your responsibility to somebody who's making uh, making and distributing devices and trying to bring people into a network to make sure that uh, that their that, that their experience is as secure as you can possibly make it and uh, it's really not all that expensive computationally to do this um, I get into performance a little bit later um, yeah. So uh, what we're doing for paying people is that we're using the most uh, sort of the simplest uh, payment structure that you can create. It's, uh, it's cryptocurrency agnostic. So as long as the currency in it that you decide to choose uh, supports payment channels of any kind, uh, you can use them. Well, payment channels, maybe I shouldn't say of any kind. It's a little too vague. but bidirectional payment channels. Um, and for those who aren't, uh, 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 for those who don't have experience with like, uh, with like the concept of cryptocurrency, uh, the big idea here is that you wanna put some amount of money on the table and then you and your neighbor can move that back and forth very efficiently. Um, and this lets you do payments and resolve payments very, very quickly uh, without any trouble. And this is sort of the real secret, is that we don't actually prevent uh, somebody from buying bandwidth and running off with it. We just resolve payments so often that the most they can run off with is like, I don't know, half a cent. So does anybody really care all that much? So it's the elimination of fraud by virtue of shrinking it down to a level where nobody cares. Um, the interesting thing about this is that you could, in theory, do this uh, do this with like a traditional centralized payment processor, but you'd still need some of the cryptocurrency payment channel concepts. So this is actually novel. Um, it's not something you could do out of the box with like a credit card payment processor. Um, you need some of the newer concepts uh, invented uh, for cryptocurrency scaling to really make it feasible uh, to move, uh, to pay somebody in small enough amounts. You know, because a gig of bandwidth may cost uh, 10 cents less than that. So, you know, if you're trying to download something and you want to pay somebody for the bandwidth you've used over the last five seconds, it's a very, very small amount of money. It's an infeasible amount of money to send with a credit card. Um, so you actually need this sort of technology uh, no matter how you were trying to do this. Um, yeah, uh, we also use Rust, uh, which uh, Mozilla, uh, who is also providing this space, um, is a big supporter of. And it, is, uh, it does live up to the hype. It's also as confusing as the hype makes it out to be, sometimes. Um, yeah, so especially for our tiny, tiny devices, um, Rust was a necessity. We could either use that or uh, C. And uh, I don't know about you, but I do not want to be writing. Uh, code that's going to be handling money in a language that's uh, that old and that unsafe and hard to get right uh, for those who are not so familiar with C programming. Um, C programming is the sort of thing where you make a typo and it comes back to eat you in your, and it comes back and eats your face. Um, so that doesn't happen with Rust, which makes me much happier. Um, and yeah, Rust is fairly, fairly straightforward to cross compile and shrink down small enough uh, to run on these routers, and that includes uh, something I think is pretty impressive, and that is that our entire billing application, uh, so, well, it's a little bit more than a billing application. It's management, tunnel management, make sure the traffic is secure, checks, uh, checks that those advertised metrics are actually real. It only consumes uh, six megabytes of storage and 20 megabytes of RAM, and that's, and that's sort of the power of Rust for you. It's a very, it's a very flexible, very cool language. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, this one's cool. And I'm actually going to uh, go ahead and ask the crowd about this because I think some people are falling asleep out there. Um, what does fast internet mean? No? Yeah, so there is, so uh, Deborah said bandwidth. And, uh, hmm? yeah, latency, that's the other one. It's the two things, so, uh, so like, Let's take a hypothetical situation uh, where you have uh, Jane and Jill, and uh, Jane has an internet connection uh, that is infinitely fast, 
but takes 30 seconds to respond to everything. And Jill has an internet connection which is very, very slow, but can respond to anything instantaneously. So if they both try and queue up Netflix, it's going to look exactly the same. You know, it's going to take one, um, it's going to take Jill 30 seconds to buffer the start of the video. It's going to take Jane, uh, um, and it's going to take Jane 30 seconds for the signal to make the round trip. Um, so in this concept, fast internet is, uh, is sort of a misnomer, because when we say it, uh, it can mean very distinct things. It doesn't actually describe a problem. Um, and uh, I'm going to make a statement that I've been saying a lot during this conference, and that is uh, that internet is fundamentally latency. Um, so like dial-up is still, so like philosophically, let's ask what is an internet connection? And the correct answer, or the, the answer that most people seem to define, is that it's a low latency communications channel with, on, with an arbitrary person. So like, let's say you have dial-up, right? Very slow internet connection, but it's an internet connection. You're talking to somebody, right? You can text message. But let's say you have uh, Jane's connection, and it takes you 30 seconds to get a signal. Well, I could toss you a flash drive, and you could plug that in in 30 seconds. So that means that internet is fundamentally about latency. Uh, less, uh, more than it is about bandwidth. Um, with that in mind, uh, we have done some cool stuff. Uh, well, specifically, we've used some existing cool stuff uh, to ensure that uh, latency is fairly distributed among connections, not necessarily bandwidth. Um, so this means that if you are talking to your neighbor, uh, so if your neighbor is sending bandwidth through you, and they decide they want to download a really big file, and you're just happily plucking away at your text message, or uh, I guess we call it instant messaging, um, then you won't be disrupted. Um, and that's, that's nice in that it ensures that, uh, that you don't really have to concern yourself with, uh, with disrupting your own quality of connection by helping somebody else out on the network. <sighs> So now, this part is perhaps more technical than the rest of this presentation. And the rest of this presentation is a little bit more technical than the average fair in this conference. But uh, I think this is really cool. So I'm going to talk to you about, uh, so I was talking about WireGuard earlier. And uh, this is actually a kernel performance trace of, uh, of traffic as it goes through uh, the kernel on an Althea device as it's transited. Um, and you can see here, WireGuard doing cha cha 20 encryption, poly 1305 authentication. I may have those backwards because I always get them mixed up. And you can see the IPv6 table stuff going on. And then you have the next level of decryption as it makes its way out. Um, well, encryption uh, as it makes its way out. Um, and this is on a MIPS device out of 2011. So uh, it's actually fairly fast, all things considered. Um, but if we take a look at a more modern piece of hardware, uh, the picture changes a lot. <laughs> You'll notice that now uh, encryption here, encryption here, and this is all everything else. You know, It's all the IPv6 rules required to get everything to the right spot and keep track of who sent who what. Now, this is this. They're the same thing. Um, and so this is what's called the flame graph. And the longer something is, the longer time it took on the CPU to process. Um, so you'll notice that this section gets a lot bigger. These sections get a lot smaller. Uh, what's going on is that modern devices have become fast enough that the level of security that WireGuard provides is very nearly free. Um, which is why I was encouraging everybody to use it, even in, uh, even in, especially in community networks, uh, to provide easy security. Because if you're going to be having a mesh networking system where bandwidth may be transited over pretty much anyone, um, it's not that expensive to uh, make sure that everybody, uh, that everybody's connection is secure. Uh, yeah, so devices, uh, this is, so this is actually sort of interesting. This is this is this device right here, um, and 
even though the even though it's out of 2011, so seven years old now, um, it costs $15 and it gets about 30 megabits per second, uh, considering that 20 is enough for 4K video. Um, I'd call this a rousing success at meeting our goal of uh, uncompromised internet experience, uh, where and by uncompromised I mean everybody can be confident in the security they're browsing, everybody can do whatever they want. So I'd say 4K Netflix is about the highest level of practical usage you're going to find for most people. And we've brought the barrier to entry, you know, the capital cost uh, down uh, about as far as we can go. I don't think we can really go any cheaper than $15 and still get like a power brick. Um, so yeah, um, this, the B1300, is actually the second diagram here. And you'll notice that if it's so much faster at decrypting, it should really be a lot faster at sending traffic than 100 megabits. Um, but that's not WireGuard. Uh, that's a lack of uh, open source packet accelerator packages. And I could talk about that all day, but the fact of the matter is that it's just work, it's just technical work that needs to be done uh, to make open source software uh, on routers better and faster. And there are already people working on it. Um, and I really hope that I can get this device to three or 400 megabits before we're seriously uh, using them for a lot of people. Um, and then you'll notice early on in this presentation, I really, um, I really talked about our goal to run all of this in like a tenth of a Slack tab. So what happens when you put uh, this sort of software on something that can in fact run Slack? Um, the correct answer is that it goes as fast as you want. Um, so uh, if you really, need, uh, really have a need for speed, uh, you can buy a bigger device and not have to mess with things like packet accelerator patches and get whatever speed you want, um, or whatever speed the network can bear. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I, think, uh, um, um, so I think this is a interesting question, uh, especially when contrasted to the last presentation, which is very much a philosophical pondering of what do we want out of our networks. If you haven't noticed, Althea is a very practical uh, let's suppose we want networks to be sustainable and for people to be rewarded for making them. How do we do that? Um, and the question becomes, uh, is, well, first of all, why pay for bandwidth at all? Uh, you know, people like unlimited bandwidth. They like that sort of aspect of subscriptions. Um, is it maybe better to uh, sell people shorter uh, subscriptions that they can change automatically? And the, the problem when you go down that route uh, is, that you're, is that you eventually end up punishing anyone who doesn't use all of the data sold. To, uh, so like, let's say we bring the subscription link all the way down. You're, you're buying an unlimited internet connection subscription for the next five minutes. Well, if I advertise, so if I advertise speed along with that, like so you're buying a 100 megabit connection for the next five minutes and it's unlimited, well, you can multiply all those together and you've just got a bandwidth. You know, you've got, you know, you bought one gig. Um, and uh, the problem with that is that if people buy a gigabyte of bandwidth and they don't necessarily use it all the time, you get in this weird sort of situation where the seller cares about what people do with the internet connections they buy. Because if they can find only people who want to uh, do like chat on IRC, they'll make more money and they, because they can sell that bandwidth more than once. You know, and that's what modern internet service providers do, is that the average oversale rate is about 20 to one. That's also another reason why they like to sell you a speed. Because if you have an apartment building with 20 units and you want to sell everybody gigabit, an ISP will run one gigabit cable to that apartment unit and then sell that extra speed to everyone. And um, so we wanted to intentionally avoid that scenario, uh, which is why Billing per byte at a very um, at a very low level of cost uh, works out better for the user and is a better way to organize things. Um, as an interesting note, uh, if you have Comcast in America, you pay uh, more than ten cents a gig uh, on average because you have a one terabyte cap by default. If you divide that out, um, it actually turns out to be quite expensive. Um, so. I thought that was funny because when we were originally planning for prices, um, I, I, um, I was trying to throw numbers at the wall and be like, you know, what's a normal price for bandwidth? 
And you know, I'm like, oh man, you know, like 10, 20 cents a gig sounds really high. And then I go and I look at what people are actually paying, uh, you know, versus uh, you know what they pay per actual usage, and it's easily. Uh, more than that, especially if you don't max out uh, your cap or have a lower cap. I know in Canada it's even worse. People have much lower bandwidth caps for higher prices. Um, but yeah, to sort of uh, wrap up this dallying on the concept of what do we want, uh, bandwidth payments actually don't reward everyone. Um, what if you're like a lot of people in this room, a mesh network organizer? Um, what do you get out of selling bandwidth? Because you're normally not the person who happens to have a tall building that it's convenient to put an antenna on. You're normally not the person who is hooking up, uh, sorry, um, you're normally not the person who is connected to the majority of the people, yet you're investing a good deal of work in like deploying a network. Um, so uh, with that, we do something that's uh, a little bit similar to what they touched on in the last presentation. Uh, which is that we let 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 organizations generate their own uh, their own we call them subnets um, subnet DAOs uh, that are configurable governance organizations. They have only two rules: um, you must have a list of nodes and some decision making body. What that decision making body looks like is up to you. Um, but the sort of function of this is that it's a way for the network to come together and make decisions and fund projects. Uh, without necessarily needing a single leader or a single point of operations or a single person to hold the funds or decide how they are spent. Um, yeah, so some UI mockups. As you can see here, this one has even voting weights. You could do whatever you want. Um, and I'm actually really interested to see what people end up working out and what ends up being the most popular strategy. Um, Yeah, so uh, I'm not actually sure how much time I have left because I, oh, I think I am nine minutes over actually. So um, yeah, uh, if anybody wants to ask, uh, this is a table of all of the current mesh networking software and this is sort of the state of the art. And in an earlier version of this presentation, uh, I actually went over all the little quirks of all the different popular mesh networking softwares um, but that alone takes about 30 minutes. So, uh, yeah, uh, I guess I'll open it to questions at this point. Go ahead. Oh, uh, do I have the only mic? I have the only mic. <laughs> okay, we have more. Um, just, so uh, don't go through this whole thing, but I'm, re I'm interested if you could talk about each column and yeah, like yeah, why, yeah. why they matter. Okay, yeah, so this is actually really interesting. Um, so you have two sort of primary uh, trade-offs, and that is, do you provide uh, the fastest way to get to a destination, and how much does adding new people cost you? Uh, so like adding new people to the network uh, obviously uses some amount of resources on each device because it needs to know how to get to these new people, um, but providing the best route is sort of a conflicting challenge. Um, so these two sides are sort of the big trade-off in mesh networking design. And uh, all, hmm. so in sort of mature technologies, everything's pretty samey, right? You know, like planes don't look dramatically different because all the commercial airliners work pretty much the same. They found what works well. Uh, that's not true here. Uh, all of these are dramatically different. <laughs> and that's part of what makes mesh networking software so interesting is that it's, uh, uh, so to speak, an unsolved field. Um, and uh, so, yeah, these two where like this is how much it costs to add a new member to the network per device such that eventually if you add too many new members to the network, some of these will start to have problems earlier than others. Uh, this is how easy it is to modify, which is mostly a consideration for us because we needed to add modifications to make sure that, uh, that we could trust the output. Um, this is whether or not the network provides the best possible route. So will your traffic go over the mesh as fast as it possibly could given the hardware provided? Obviously, the software cannot make the hardware better. Um, well, conceivably it can, but that's normally by using uh, like hardware extensions that are already there. So let's, let's not get into that discussion. Um, and then secure. This is 
you know, this entire like column is really uh, a rabbit hole in and of itself because secure means different things to a lot of these. Um, and so, do, so is sort of fast. I mean, what does it mean to be fast? We already discussed the fact that uh, the, concept of bandwidth, uh, the concept of fast internet is sort of an illusion. And so is the question of what does it mean to be fast? Um, but the, once again, they all take a different approach too. So it's a nice little rabbit hole that you could probably spend 45 minutes to an hour on. Oh, cool, didn't fall. <laughs> Okay, I look at the strategy, and it looks to me like you have developed, or the, the team has developed, basically the Airbnb of internet and communications. Yeah, that's sort of the style we were going for. I mean, it's not exactly the most, uh, so like as I've said, it's primarily a, prag a, a, a pragmatic decentralized ISP. You know, we're not trying to solve all the problems in the world, we're trying to solve uh, the ones that we can get to. <laughs> yeah. So you were uh, talking like in the other slides about the metrics that you can optimize for. Like, can I, yeah. Like, so, like, my question would be like, as someone who will be paying for like traffic, mm -hmm. uh, can I choose the way it is optimized? Yes, and yes, yes, yes. So uh, in the current uh, implementation, there's a slider where you choose between like how much you care about the price versus how much you care about the quality, and it starts in the middle, where like uh, they're weighted evenly. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what defines evenly is sort of different on each network, and I don't yet normalize them based on like what's available. So for example, there may be a region where internet connections are just bad, and starting in the middle is a bad idea. But yeah, so users can select which one they care about most. Uh, the protocol weighs all the available data before it makes a selection. Um, Yeah, I was wondering if you had any more thoughts on uh, on Rust and basically oh. uh, hurdles you had to overcome or things that did particularly well, particularly on uh, embedded devices. That's a, that's a, so that's actually a really good question because Rust is uh, uh, Rust is a, a good bit different from what you're probably used to in other programming languages. There's new concepts, uh, new things it, it introduces, uh, new things it introduces. Uh, but in exchange, you get um, a lot of efficiency and a really uh, cool abilities to uh, to like get away with stuff that was previously impossible. You know, like uh, if we had decided to do this with C or Lua or something like that, we would probably still be uh, in our basements trying to code everything we've used. But with Rust, we just throw in all the libraries we want and. Uh, the compiler manages to optimize it enough and make it small enough. Um, also, uh, the, uh, so the Rust community is really nice and helpful. They try and write very accessible documentation because they know they're going to be uh, introducing new concepts to people. Even, even advanced experienced programmers uh, will probably be seeing some new things in Rust. Um, so they've been very helpful in that aspect and we've been, uh, and we've been fortunate enough to interact with them and have them uh, help us out with our pull requests, merge new features, and fix problems. Um, I'd say the real like challenge we had to deal with with Rust is not only like architecting code for a world in which there is no garbage collector or or, or like manual memory management, um, and also getting it to work on the routers because cross compiling is a challenging task even if you're doing it with C, which is considered to be the easiest thing to cross compile. Um, it took me, I think, a week or two to really get these flags down. And then, of course, there's a pretty big barrier to entry to do all the compiling required. You'll notice we're looking at two hours and 10 to 15 minutes of compiling to get something onto, uh, onto an OpenWRT device, um, which isn't the greatest thing in the world. It's a lot less painful since we got a build server, though, and it pushes new nightly, and it builds new ni nightly releases uh, every night so, and uploads them to an easy place for people to download. Um, um, I, oh. Hello. I have a question from the chat, actually. Um, the wire guard, does it uh, encrypt node to node or end, uh, start to end? Yeah, so that's actually something I skipped over in the interest of time a little bit. But since it seems that the stop is in a hard stop, let's get into that. Um, the, uh, 
we actually use two layers of WireGuard. Um, specifically, we use WireGuard along the entire path and WireGuard in between each node. Because you have this problem, like let's say you have a wireless node, so you, know, um, you have A and B talking to each other and broadcasting, well, A, B, and uh, C, and uh, you get a transmission from A that's going to be paid to go off somewhere else, right? How do you make sure that that's not actually C sending you data and saying, hey, I'm A, bill A for this. You know, make A pay for this data, please. Uh, here's a lot of data, here's even more data. Um, you know, how do you stop that? So you have to authenticate uh, individual connections between devices. So we take the broadcast domain and we split it up into multiple wire guard tunnels um, at each hop. And most of, you know, sometimes that's just going to be one hop if it's just a cable, for example. Um, but in that way, we end up uh, ensuring that nobody can scam anybody on bandwidth. Uh, well, nobody can attribute bandwidth to someone else. Um, it's a real testament to how efficient WireGuard is that we can get away with this. Um, we can do like more than one layer of encryption uh, and not have an issue with it. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Uh, yeah, that was great. We, I guess cool. we want to give people a little bit of a break before closing remarks, but we'll start up at, the, I guess, at, on the half hour for closing remarks. Sounds good. Cool, thanks.